Hi everybody, Aaron Stein here, Chief Content Officer at War on the Rocks. I want to thank our sponsor for this episode, All Quiet on the Second Front, a really awesome and amazing podcast by Second Front Systems that's focused on cybersecurity, defense tech, and innovation, the topics that we cover weekly over at War on the Rocks, and that if you spent any time in the Pentagon, Washington, D.C., or even out in Silicon Valley are talked about a lot. So take some time to check it out at secondfront.com slash podcast or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Welcome to the War on the Rocks podcast covering strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. I'm here once again with Mike Kaufman. And as always, we're talking about the war in Ukraine. Mike, eager to get your overview of the main events. Why don't we start as we, uh, as we always do on the front lines? My general sense of where we are right now is that the Ukraine offensive culminated earlier in the fall. The Russian, you know, offensive, uh, such as it has, had basically been comprised of a three-prong attack. One main effort at Avdiivka. That effort has petered out, and the situation around Avdiivka has thankfully stabilized. Although I don't think things are done there as we look out over the course of the winter. Another effort took place around Bakhmut, and the Russian counterattack at Bakhmut managed to reclaim some of the territory that was liberated, uh, particularly around northern Bakhmut, and they're trying to come after the parts around southern flank of Bakhmut as well. There was a Russian attack as well, or efforts made by Kupiansk further north, and probably most recently, the one area where they made some progress is in a town that they've been fighting over for a long time by the name of Marinka. And they're also trying to pressure Nova Mihailovka. And the reason they seem to be doing that is for those who have followed the war, remember these are fairly small cities by, actually by the city of Donetsk. And uh, last year, Russia had a whole series of very unsuccessful attacks during the winter offensive by Bulidar. Like It actually became quite prominent in the news as Russian naval infantry was forced to keep attacking and attacking repeatedly. And Ukraine's 72nd Brigade, which was holding Bulidar really well, defended by minefields, anti-tank guided missiles. So it was clear that their direct assaults failed. And the reason they're trying to push the Marinka is they're trying to get around and cut off the lines of communication, the lines of supply routes to Vuladar, and essentially trying to still take Vuladar, but take it that way by taking some cities that are effectively northeast of it and then sever the ground lines of communication to it. And so that's still to some extent in play. I do think that as the winter has settled in, we once again see a period of fighting not dissimilar from what happened last winter, right? You see a lot of attritional fighting. People have settled in largely into fighting on static positions. Russia has the initiative along most of the front line, and it's fair to say that Russia has a substantial fires advantage. You know, Ukraine probably needs somewhere, you know, around, at least in my view, 3,000 rounds per day in terms of artillery, main caliber artillery ammunition that it can fire. It's probably able to get no more than two. I think part of that is because U.S. assistance is very much running on fumes at this point. There's the funding available for U.S. military assistance to Ukraine. Whereas Russia has recovered both production and had a substantial influx of artillery ammunition from North Korea. So we've gone from a situation where Ukraine enjoyed maybe a 1.5 to 2 to 1 fires advantage over the summer to relative parity around September, October, to Russia now having a very clear fires advantage maybe around uh, as far as 5 to 1 on the front line. Now, that advantage isn't decisive. You haven't seen Russian forces have a breakthrough or make much progress, but it's notable and it could increase because Russian art artillery ammunition production rates are only going up and they're going to go up next year. And it's not clear how much ammunition they're ultimately going to get from countries like North Korea and Iran. So let me ask more about that then. What about the news of North Korea sending short-range ballistic missiles, talk that Russia is planning on buying more missiles from Iran. How does this factor in? Sure. So first, regarding that news, yeah, from what I understand based on what was announced today by you know, National Security Council spokesperson, that 
of Russia has received and has employed North Korean short-range ballistic missiles and received launchers with them as well. I don't know what they are. I'm going to guess it's the North Korean analog to the Iskander M. They have one. It looks like something around that range. And it's clearly going to be used by Russia to supplement their own long-range strike capabilities. Russia has significantly increased production of missiles, but I think one area where they're going to really struggle ramping them up is in production of short-range ballistic missiles because their monthly production rate was quite low for systems like Iskander M. And I suspect that they're trying to offset that with supplies from North Korea. And there's word, and I, and I think over the course of these podcasts, I've been raising occasionally every so many months the prospect that Russia would get ballistic missiles from Iran or North Korea. And, and here we finally are. They, they both have North Korean missiles and they're reaching out to Iran to potentially procure missiles from them. My understanding is that the sanctions regime that governor constrained Iran in terms of export of these types of missiles has been lifted, but I'm not an expert on this. I'm not an expert on this, so I'm just not going to wade into that area. But my general impression is that like that Russia can actually procure these capabilities from Iran. Not that Iran would necessarily be bothered from transferring them anyway. And also Russia has access to a significantly larger supply of drones as well that is locally producing, basically the locally produced version of the Iranian Shahed variants. And so that has been fully localized within Russia. They're churning these out. So they are churning them out. I think they still probably are getting shipments from Iran as well, but they have localized production and they've probably made like their own modifications as well. I would say regarding the import of missiles, you know, the reality is that the Russian missile production rate is still not enough to offset all the munitions they spent in 2022 and 2023. And they've been saving up missiles for salvo size attacks that they have begun launching against Ukraine. First couple started in November. Then it was, you know, sort of they were evenly spaced out. But we've seen, particularly in the last uh, week, larger and larger sorties. Clearly, they're trying to saturate air defense and trying to see what they can do. But this was to be expected. I think we discussed it extensively before the winter. The Russia was clearly saving up munitions for another winter campaign, strike campaign. But this year, it's far less one-sided. It's clear also that Ukraine has increased its capacity to strike back against Russia. You see increased Ukrainian attacks against Russian critical infrastructure, retaliatory attacks against cities like Belgorod, and greater strikes against Russian military base in Crimea. In fact, even today, this seemed to be a fairly sizable strike. I suspect maybe by a combination of air-launched cruise missiles and drones. I've spoken before about the fact that Ukraine was increasing production of strike drones that are not dissimilar to what the Shahed can do, and probably even better in some respects. And that Ukraine had Crimea in its sights as an area of vulnerability, particularly Russian bases there of various types. And that over time, Ukraine could substantially increase its capacity to attack Russian forces far behind the line of contact or Russian critical infrastructure or Russian energy infrastructure of significance to the Russian economy. Well, let me ask more about that, because I know you've talked in the past about what the impact of Russian strikes against Ukrainian infrastructure and Ukrainian cities is likely to be. But what is the impact of these Ukrainian strikes? The honest answer is that we're, I think we're going to find out this year. Uh, there have been different types of strikes. There have been strikes primarily for publicity purposes to hurt Russia's reputations done by Gore, the military intelligence component. The Those strikes, I think, were primarily symbolic, and they inflicted some damage, but that wasn't their primary purpose. There are strikes that are done by the military, and I think the question there is to what extent they can scale them up. Right. Conventional warfare very much comes down to scaling. It's not about doing pinprick strikes or, you know, yes, boutique capabilities definitely can make their impact. It's a question of the extent to which Ukraine can online production of these drone systems, and ideally the West can help, to then expand and conduct a series of strike campaigns. This can create real challenges for the Russian military. It's not a war-winning capability, let's just be clear. There isn't a substitute for the close battle, I I disagree with the kind of the deep battle enthusiasts that think that if you just have some range rings on a map that that's what wins the war it doesn't but it 
or can make a real impact at a time when Ukraine and the West do not have the resources for a major offensive operation. Moving a little bit south from Crimea, tell us about the situation in the Black Sea. I think the Black Sea was probably the silver lining of last year. And the one area where Ukraine was successful was in, in effect, breaking the sort of Russian blockade in being and in having some high profile attacks against Russian Black Sea fleet. Now, to be clear, at, at Russia's Black Sea fleet, in terms of the, the missile shooters that have been rebased in the overseas, their lives are still intact. But most recently, you had another high profile attack. Uh, against a Russian LST landing ship tank. It's a transport vessel that was in dock uh, Sevastopol that basically destroyed it. And the the strikes have you know made made an impact. It's clear that Ukraine is slowly degrading the Black Sea fleet. Now, how much of an impact that's going to make is a good question. What I've noticed is in December, Ukraine shipping that is export of goods from Ukrainian ports and import of goods has risen significantly. So if before December, it was fair to say that maybe it was half or less of what the the rate of shipping had been, now it's, it's jumped significantly. And it's an interesting question as to whether Russia is going to do anything about it or if they can or if they're effectively being suppressed. Because it's clear that while Russia retains the initial march of the front line, it had lost the initiative in the Black Sea. And that matters. That matters for Ukraine's economic viability, ability to, to export goods, and, and also uh, receive imports. So I suspect that that's the one area of comparative advantage and leverage that Ukraine can build on this year. And it's very much worth watching, and we haven't covered enough. I also am guilty of not covering enough. One reason why is can't really do field work in the Black Sea, uh, access issues, but we'll we'll see. I, I think I joked I joked about us on a different podcast with Rob when we're discuss Rob Lee when we we're discussing it. And I was saying, you know, maybe we could paddle out there and the so so one issue is just, you know, observation problems. But another one is that the situation has has evolved quite significantly just in the last couple of months, and particularly in the last month. Hi everybody, Aaron again. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about All Quiet on the Second Front, our supporter for this episode. You can check them out at secondfront.com slash podcast. And I recommend doing so quickly. The reason why is that our friends at Second Front Systems are giving away a limited number of free War on the Rocks memberships. That's right, a limited number of free War on the Rocks memberships in future All Quiet on the Second Front podcasts. So tune into their podcasts to get that coupon code and sign up. But really, you should already be listening to the show. I found the show a few months ago on one of those days where I was looking for something to listen before I set out on my daily jog. And if you listen to Tyler Sweat, the CEO, you'll know why I smashed that listen button when hearing a clip from the show. When we agreed that the framing would be if Between Two Ferns and C-SPAN had a baby, it would be this podcast. The first 10 people we called were like, we're in. I tuned into a recent interview just last week with Tyler and Tara Murphy Doherty, where she made one of those really interesting points that are filled in each one of the episodes. The piece that they're incredibly missing is there's a really mundane, unglamorous, but wildly important aspect to making acquisition work better for the warfighter, which is just the day-to-day workflows that people in the acquisition workforce execute and the capabilities they have been given or not been given to execute those day-to-day workflows. That's the process improvement piece that the private sector has revolutionized over the past 20 years while DOD still runs on email, data calls, and spreadsheets. I really do listen to this show, and you really should go and check it out, not just because you'll learn something, but because if you listen to the next couple of episodes, you will figure out what that promo code is for free War on the Rocks memberships. And now back to the show. Let's dwell on this a little bit more since we do want to give it more coverage. Uh, There's been some reporting about minesweepers, uh, whether or not Turkey is going to let them go through the Bosporus. Can you tell us a little bit more when it comes to the new route that Ukraine has pioneered since the grain deal broke down last summer? What is the importance of minesweepers? What role do these play in actually getting shipping out from Ukraine? You know, Russia's basically been, been caught 
in not wanting to engage in unrestricted naval warfare, right? And just taking out commercial vessels, but also not having the ability to enforce a blockade in practice. And the way they've been trying to maintain a, a, a blockade kind of in being is through occasionally air deploying mines, for example, dropping mines with aircraft. And the thing about it is that you don't need to deploy a substantial minefields. If commercial vessels know there are mines or if the people who insure them know there are mines, it's a problem, right? You, the fact that there are mines anywhere in the water and you don't know how many and where they are is a real issue for, for any sort of merchant vessel. So this is where minesweepers come in because if Russia is going to contest this shipping channel and is going to try to do it in kind of the cheapest, low-risk way possible that they can. For them, the best way to address that is with minesweepers. And you can have minesweepers clear the channel. And if you have them doing that, then commercial shipping can become much more comfortable in using it. Oh, oh, that makes sense. That's my interpretation of what's going on. Now, shifting track a little bit, going to the broader diplomatic scene, there's been some reporting, there have been some rumors that there is a newfound interest on the part of uh, Moscow, on the part of Vladimir Putin, in negotiating some kind of end to this war. What do you make of that? What should we make of that? Yeah, so it was an interesting New York Times story. Here's how I interpret it. And just to be clear, part of this really stems from sort of my own thinking, I interpret Russian motivations. So I suspect that there is truth to the fact that Moscow is reaching out with all these feelers trying to engage people. I don't think that they're doing it in earnest. I think that if they want to negotiate about anything, it's still in pursuit of maximalist war aims. So it's negotiation, but with the opening position that would de facto require Ukrainian capitulation and Western capitulation. I Meaning I think a lot of a lot of the Russian position is just fundamentally a non-starter. I also don't take it very seriously because uh, there's not a mutually hurting stalemate on the ground right now. The war is not a stalemate. It may seem momentarily stalemate in terms of the phase that we're in, and we've been in this kind of phase before, but Russia actually holds a lot of material advantages in this coming year. They're not decisive, but nonetheless, there isn't a clear reason for them to want to negotiate. And I think part of the reason they're doing it is they want to communicate to a lot of Ukraine supporters, particularly amongst European countries, that there's another option. And and to capitalize on perhaps some of the gloom and doom that we've seen this winter, and and some of the some of the forces that the sort of the headwinds that Ukrainian support has has begun to face in the West, and to suggest to them that yes, maybe they're going to negotiate. Whereas in practice, it's clear to me that that's not really the Russian aim. First, we've seen in other wars in other contexts, for example, Syria, when they've negotiated a ceasefire, they largely used it to isolate an area, consolidate their control, and then begin a new phase of the war. So any negotiation is not likely to settle the war. It would, just, it would just help Russia during a rearmament period, and then they would come back with a significant percentage of military capability restored, meaning I, I don't take that as a serious proposition right now. Second, it seems principally to be a non-starter for Ukraine. And let me ask more about that too. I mean, what's the mood in Ukraine? On the other podcast that we have the Russia Continuity. I had a two-part episode with Andrei Zahornuk, who's a good colleague and, and friend in Kiev, kind of titled The Perspective from Kiev that came out, I think, just recently. And folks are, are welcome to listen to, to that podcast. But so my own impression, and I'm on in Ukraine right now. I, I, I was last there around middle of November. But my own my own impression is that the, the mood in Ukraine, while obviously a lot more pessimistic, given everybody acknowledges that defense have failed, it's not despair and it's not gloom and doom. That's not the reality of, of the sentiments in Ukraine. What I hear and my impression of it is, you know, folks understand that it's going to be a long war now. They're looking at what are the big changes and what are the things that they have to do. There's, there's a distinct self-awareness about the problem, the nature of the problem. But there isn't a desire to begin negotiating. There isn't a desire to give up. I don't heard that. I haven't seen that either in Kiev or sort of anywhere on the front line. And so you sometimes get this real dissonance between uh, folks folks in the West who think like, maybe this is now a good time to negotiate when in practice you don't see 
you don't see this kind of sentiment in Ukraine. And I think you should be very careful in, in taking it as taking on faith as something that Russia is actually interested in because I don't buy it. And I think that these overtures are more a tactic. I think that if anything, Russia is going to expand their campaign and both a strike campaign, but more importantly, next this year, I was about to say next year because my mind is still transitioning to the fact that we're in 2024. This year is more their window of opportunity. Okay. It could close actually. With Western support, Ukraine could retake and rebuild the advantage, I mean, retake the initiative, rebuild the advantage in 2025. It's very possible, right? As you, Ukraine can create another, another window of opportunity for itself too. But most importantly, Russia faces a great deal of uncertainty after this year, depending on how things go, right? So for them, in some respects, it probably makes sense to try to combine a military effort with a political effort, but I see only one of those two as as being uh, genuine. Finally, there's also been some reporting recently in the Washington Post about looking back at the Ukrainian offensive. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that reporting. More broadly, I'm curious to get your bottom line sense of you know, what happened with the offensive. Why did it turn out the way it did? I thought that... Uh, of the two part stories that the Washington Post did, I thought that the first part was quite good that talked about the build of the planning for the offensive and helped unpack or at least give insight into what folks thought in, in the US, in Ukraine, and how some of it came together or maybe didn't come together so well. As you know, there, there were a lot of recriminations later on, and, and there's 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 a, a fair deal of const- contested territory in terms of who wanted what to happen sooner or later. To me, a lot of what the Washington Post wrote on the first part of this uh, rang true. And your bottom line about, about looking back at the offensive? If I was to distill it into three main issues, right, that I think are lessons learned of what needs to be put together for 2025. And this is not an exhaustive or exclusive list, I want to be clear. The first is Ukraine needs to be provided a decisive fire's advantage, right? And that can that can happen a number of ways. It doesn't just have to be quantity of artillery, but artillery ammunition matters, right? Increasingly, drones can offset artillery requirements. Quality and long-range precision strike can add to it, can be a real force multiplier. But Ukraine lacked a decisive fire's advantage. That's the reality. At most, it was two to one against Russian artillery. And it could not sufficiently attrition Russian forces. This is issue one. And attrition has been decisive in this war in enabling maneuver. And and against a prepared defense, a maneuverist approach just isn't going to work without this very significant fire's advantage. The second one has been covered extensively, I think, in my work with Rob Lee and Jack Watling's and Rusi's work here. I agree with him that we have to significantly revisit training and most importantly, uh, help get Ukrainian forces to a place where they can scale offensive operations. Operating at a rate of two reinforced companies per brigade isn't going to be sufficient, which is if we are able to provide a fire's advantage, and as an if, we need to get Ukrainian forces working with them to to a place where they can exploit it. If they cannot operate at scale, they will not be able to exploit it, right? So this is the second part of it. Uh, And the third part, this is a conversation about enablers, right? Against a prepared defense of this type, you need the right amount of breaching equipment, mine clearing, short-range air defense, if we can provide that fire's advantage and Ukrainian forces are able to operate at, at greater scale, we also need to provide the right enablers for them to do it. And most importantly, the enablers conversation has to lead the target, meaning we cannot prepare for the offensive of 2023. In this war, things evolve very quickly over the span of three months. What I saw in November already looked different than the things that I had seen by mid-late July, right? And I'm highlighting this because FPVs were not the principal challenge. First-person view strike drones were not the principal challenge 
when Ukraine began the offensive in the first week of June. They were the principal challenge come, you know, September, October, right? So when we talk about enablers, the conversation has to actually lead this problem. And we have to talk about how how an advancing force is going to deal with FPVs, what kind of advantages they can provide, let's say, in electronic warfare, in counter UAS systems, and what kind of advantages they can provide with their own strike drones. But I, won't, don't, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. What I'm simply saying is that in thinking about the offensive or, or rebuilding the capacity to conduct one, we have to take the right lessons learned from 2023. We also have to pay very close attention to our technological innovation and tactical uh, adaptation is going and changes in force employment in this war, right? So that if you, let's say you show up to the breaching operation in 2023, you don't have enough air defense against Russian combat helicopters, and you don't have enough mine breaching equipment, this, that, and other. You don't want to start a major operation in 2025, find out that you actually don't have the right enablers for what is happening on the battlefield at that point, right? So these are the three main areas, three buckets, I, I, what I say as far as categories. I, I do agree that training is key and should be one of the central central pillars of Western efforts operating jointly with Ukraine. I don't know if I would say that that was the foremost reason for why the offensive failed. I think that it was a combination of deficits in these three categories. Any final thoughts? So my final thought is that the key to to this year is evolving the approach to the war, at least the way the way I look at the way I think about it, from thinking in six-month increments to something more long-term, maybe along the lines of 18 months, and to getting proper alignment. I think what the Washington Post article highlighted and the biggest takeaway from that are, are not the nuances and the details, but the fact that alignment in terms of strategy is not where it should have been between the United States, other leading countries in the West, and Ukraine. And because military strategy is very much governed not just by resource constraints, but also by political decisions and choices, I think it's very important that we work on the unity of effort part of the equation, both between Western countries and Ukraine, but also I think that that's a conversation that has to, that has to evolve within Ukraine itself, within Kiev. And and if, if we can get that right, then I I would feel a lot more confident, a lot better about what can what can be done in 2024. Mike, thanks for sitting down to talk to us. If listeners want to hear more of Mike's thoughts, want to hear features like the perspective from Ukraine, other interviews that Mike's done, uh, if you're interested in other content such as Unspent Rounds or the Insider podcast hosted by my colleague Aaron Stein or some of my own map features, uh, please consider becoming a member of War on the Rocks, www.waronTheRocks.com backslash membership.